God bless us and the Virgin protect us. I want to explicitly acknowledge my debt and gratitude to Our Lady of Fatima. She has to get the credit for anything good, true, or beautiful in these Novena Conferences. All the faults are mine. One little note before we get started. As is my custom, throughout the conferences, the quotes will be edited, cut and pasted for the sake of time and clarity. Ave Maria Purissima, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. On September 8, 1916, the birthday of Our Lady, the servant of God, Luigina Sinapi, was born in a small town about 90 miles south of Rome. At the age of 16, Luigina joined the Daughters of St. Paul in Rome, but she wasn't able to persevere because of her poor health. Shortly after she returned home, her mother died suddenly, so at the age of 17, she took over the care of her younger brothers, but her health continued to decline. She was stricken with terrible abdominal pains, which led to the discovery that she had an inoperable intestinal tumor. On August 15, 1933, Luigina received the last rites and was already in what seemed to be her last agony, when suddenly she saw our Lord next to her bed, smiling down upon her. He said, I have come to give you a beautiful gift. Look. On the other side of the bed, Luigina saw a beautiful woman smiling at her. She thought her own mother had come with our Lord to take her to heaven and said, Oh, you've become so beautiful in heaven, Mother, so much that I don't recognize you. Our Lord said, Look a little closer. It was Our Lady. Our Lord said, We have come to make you a proposal. You are free to choose. Do you want to die and to ascend in paradise? Or would you be willing to offer yourself as a victim for the church and for priests? She was shown the situation of the church and the spiritual condition of so many priests who were living in danger of losing their souls. She chose to stay and offer herself as a victim for the church and for priests. Our Lord then told her that she was going to remain a lay woman in the world and told her that his mother would be her advocate and guide, that she would often be misunderstood, that she would suffer greatly, and that she would die alone, all of which came to pass. When our Lord finished speaking, Luigina was suddenly completely healed. Not long afterwards, her family was scattered when they lost their home, and as a result, her little brothers were sent to relatives or boarding school, while Luigina left to work in Rome. And so it was that on April 12, 1937, she took a pilgrimage to Tre Fontane, a Trappist abbey south of Rome along the Via Laurentina, where there are actually a number of spiritually significant sites. There's a chapel built over a crypt where St. Paul was held just before his execution. It's also the burial site of St. Zeno and his 10,203 companions, who were Christian slaves who worked on the construction of the Baths of Diocletian, and then in about AD 299 were massacred when the project was finished. The chapel itself got its name, Santa Maria Scalacelli, St. Mary of the Stairway to Heaven, as a result of a famous vision that St. Bernard had there. He was saying a requiem mass in that chapel, in the presence of Pope Innocent II, when suddenly he had a vision of souls being released from purgatory by virtue of the mass, and then being escorted by angels up a staircase to heaven. The Abbey also has a church built on the very site where on June 29, 67 AD, St. Paul was martyred. Inside that church, in the back corner on the epistle side, there's a short marble chopping block across which St. Paul laid his neck. A soldier chopped off his head, which bounced three times down the gentle hillside. At each point where St. Paul's head bounced, a spring immediately began to flow, which is why it's now called Tre Fontane, the Three Fountains. The church itself is level, of course, but along the epistle side there's a rail. Between the rail and the wall are three altars, each one built on sort of a very long step, which roughly follows the natural slope of the hill. So on the epistle side there's a marble chopping block in the back corner, and then the sloping area with three side altars along the wall. And each altar is built immediately above one of the springs where St. Paul's head bounced, and under each altar is a pipe where the water would flow. In the 19th century, the Trappists planted a great number of eucalyptus trees in the area surrounding Tre Fontane. Luigina was walking in a large grove of these trees on a nearby hill when her attention was drawn to a dirt cave in which she saw what appeared to be the remains of an aborted baby. Saying a prayer of mercy and forgiveness, she dug a little grave and buried a miraculous metal together with the little bones. Suddenly, Our Lady appeared to her, enveloped in a great light. Our Lady told Luigina, I will return to this place of sin and I will convert and make use of a man who combats the church and who will desire to kill the Pope. 
Go to St. Peter's Square, and there you'll find a lady dressed in black who will take you to a brother who is a cardinal. To him you will transmit what I have just told you, and you are to tell him also that soon he will become Pope. Luigina did as she was told. She went to St. Peter's Square and came upon the woman dressed in black. It was the Marquise Elisabetta Pacelli. The Marquise then introduced Luigina to her brother, Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli. Luigina told the Cardinal what Our Lady had said. I will return to this place of sin, and I will convert and make use of a man who combats the church, and who will desire to kill the Pope. Go to St. Peter's Square, and there you will find a lady dressed in black, who will take you to her brother who is a Cardinal. To him you will transmit what I have just told you, and you are to tell him that also that soon he will become Pope. Having heard the message, Cardinal Pacelli responded, If they're roses, they'll bloom. Two years later, he was elected Pope and took the name Pius XII. I will return to this place of sin, and I will convert and make use of a man who combats the church and who will desire to kill the Pope. What follows are a series of quotes and paraphrases taken, for the most part, from the personal diaries of that very man, the man who combated the church and desired to kill the Pope, and which are recorded by Saverio Gaeta in his brilliant book, Il Vigente. In Rome on May 9, 1913, a mother gave birth to her third son. The child was born into a very rough family. His, family, Anton his father, Antonio Conocuola, was in and out of jail, and when he was home, he was a screaming, blaspheming drunk who beat his wife and children. The baby was baptized on August 15th, the Feast of the Assumption. The reason for the three-month delay was what, that his father insisted that the godfather be present, so they had to wait until he was released from jail. At the ceremony, his father was well under the influence. When the priest asked him what name he wanted to give the baby, his father replied, Giordano Bruno, like the guy you priests burn alive. The pastor, obviously opposed to naming a child after a condemned heretic, tried to dissuade Antonio until he finally agreed to drop Giordano and to only use the name Bruno. Now, if you don't know who Giordano Bruno was, then you won't really get the full force of how truly outrageous the little baby's father was acting here. So we'll pause for a moment to explain that. Giordano Bruno was a Dominican friar who was ordained in Naples in 1572. And by 1576, had already been formally accused of heresy. He found his way to Rome, but he didn't find his way to the faith. He abandoned the priesthood shortly thereafter and wandered about, apparently oblivious to his solemn vow of chastity, joining various sects, practicing magic as in sorcery, and because of an insolent attitude, managed to be excommunicated by the Calvinists in Geneva as well as the Lutherans in Germany. In 1599, he was tried for heresy by the Roman Inquisition, for claiming that Christ was not God, but merely an unusually skillful sorcerer, that the devil will be saved, that the Holy Spirit is the soul of the world, for denying the Most Holy Trinity, and so forth. He was given time to retract his errors, but he refused to retract in any way, and insisted that the judges had no authority over him. And so in January 1600, the Inquisition finally condemned him for his theological errors, not for his defense of the Copernican system of astronomy, nor for his doctrine that there was a plurality of inhabited worlds. He was turned over to the secular authorities, who burned him at the stake in the Campo del Fiore in February 1600. Enlightened thinkers turned him into sort of a poster boy as a supposed martyr for science and free thinking, as opposed to evil, retrograde Catholic Church. Certainly any one of us with a serious scientific education that touched upon astronomical matters has heard of Giordano Bruno. He's just another club they use to beat on us. And in Rome, he has a public monument. Why is that? Well, in 1884, Leo XIII published his great encyclical, Humanum Janus, on Freemasonry. In response, the Grand Master of the Grand Orient Lodge of Italy sculpted a statue of Giordano Bruno, which in 1899 was unveiled in a public plaza in Rome to the accompaniment of a lot of speeches and a bunch of Masonic mumbo-jumbo. And every year since then, various and sundry Masons, atheists, pantheists, freethinkers, and other enemies of the Church gather at the statue on the anniversary of his execution for a ceremony in which a representative of the mayor of Rome lays a wreath at its feet. It's a perfect illustration of the teaching of Leo XIII, who said, quote, Possessed by the spirit of Satan, whose instrument they are, the Masonic sects burn like him with a deadly and implacable hatred of Jesus Christ and of his work, and they endeavor by every means to overthrow and fetter it. Close quote, the Vicar of Christ. Okay, all that by way of background. Don't think that the fine arts don't matter. 
they really matter. Without such a sculpture, what are the odds of a man like Antonio even knowing about Giordano Bruno? Little or none. The fine arts are very important. So as we were saying, when the priest asked him what name he wanted to give to the baby, his father said, Giordano Bruno, like the guy you priests burned alive. And the pastor argued with Antonio until he agreed to do drop Giordano and to only use the name Bruno. And so it was that little Bruno Cornicola was baptized. It was a rough life. He comments on his childhood, quote, Abandoned to ourselves, surrounded by squalid moral misery, we kids spent a very sad childhood. Close quote. As a child, he was always hungry. Bruno. At home, we ate badly, if we ate at all. Often my father, in a drunken fit, would throw everything out the window. So like little dogs, we would run around trying to collect something. In those days, restaurants had waste buckets outside, which contained the slop meant for the pigs, which we would dig through and take the bigger pieces and eat them. We'd steal the locust beans from the horses. By the age of 10, Bruno was living on the streets, sleeping in a cemetery chapel or on some steps near the Basilica of St. John Lateran. Wrapping myself in newspapers, going to bed with tears, hunger, and burning anger against everybody because I saw them happy and rich. On a cold morning in January 1927, a widow in her 60s on her way to daily mass gently woke up Bruno, asking him why he slept there and how old he was. Do you take communion? asked the lady. What's communion? Bruno asked. How do you not know? Doesn't your mother take communion? On occasion she makes pasta or minstroni. The good lady understood my frightful ignorance and the urgent need to help me, and she invited me to follow her in the church, promising me a piece of pizza for breakfast. Hungry as I was, I could not get a better gift. Of all the talk, I had only understood pizza. Every morning for several months, besides making sure he had his breakfast, the widow took Bruno to a catechism class taught by a passionate priest to the most abandoned children. He learned his basic prayers. During the retreat and preparation for Confirmation and Holy Communion, when the priest preached meditation on love for Our Lady, he invited all the boys to kneel before the painting of Our Lady at her altar. Bruno later recalled, I looked at the Virgin Mother, I thought of her love, and I compared to my mother's. How different they were, and how happy a child of that mother would be. And he said to her in his heart, If you're really my mother, Take me with you. After finishing the retreat, he was confirmed and received his first Holy Communion with a group of boys from a Reform school. After the ceremony, carrying a booklet on the Holy Mass written by St. Alphonsus and the rosary that had been given to him as a remembrance, he returned home, intent on putting into practice the good things he had learned. I found my mother at the top of the stairs, fussing in front of the stove in the middle of a cloud of smoke preparing to feed my father. As soon as she saw me, she scolded me because she hadn't seen me since I'd run away. The confessor told me I must not be a cause of worry to you and Dad, and I must ask your forgiveness. So I asked you to forgive me for all the wrongs I did to you, the punches, the slaps, and the bites I gave you. I asked you to forgive me for breaking your finger. Do you still think about those things? Just give me a hand. And she gave me a kick that made me roll down the steep stairs. I got upset and returned to my old self. Filled with profanity, I threw the book in the rosary because I had no stones at hand. I left home. He slept where he could and ate when he could. The squalid misery in which I was forced to live without being able to see the slightest glimpse of an exit, and the conviction that bourgeois society was solely responsible for my misery and unhappiness, filled me with hatred and a desire for vengeance. At the age of 20, he got his first pair of real shoes, new clothes, and a new coat when he entered the military. He returned to Rome in September 1935 and got engaged to Yolanda Logato, whom he had known since he was a small child. They argued over the marriage. Bruno wanted it to be secular, and Yolanda insisted that it be in the church. He finally agreed to be married in the sacristy, which came to pass in March 1936. After the ceremony, Bruno went to his father-in-law's home to get Yolanda's trunk with a few sheets and clothing. Then as a honeymoon trip, the two newlyweds walked down to the square where Bruno's parents and his brother Mario's family were living in two adjacent cabins. 
Between the two buildings was a five foot wide and six and a half foot long space covered with a canopy in which they set up a bed made out of a couple planks of wood covered with a bag stuffed with corn leaves. The newlyweds made themselves at home. Bruno began to attend underground meetings of the Communist Party, and they soon convinced Bruno to become a spy. So he enlisted as a volunteer in the Italian army mission that the Mussolini government was organizing to support Franco, the Catholic side, in the Spanish Civil War. Spain had fallen under the control of the Communists, and the Spanish government had the support of Stalin, while Franco was the leader of the forces fighting the Communists. Bruno's mission was to pass information about Franco's forces on to the Communists. He fought many battles, and also repeatedly betrayed his wedding vows. During this time, he became friends with a German soldier named Otto, who spoke to Bruno about the Lord and the Bible. One day, Bruno asked Otto to enter a Catholic church with him. Otto refused, quote, I will not go into that synagogue of Satan, into that puppet theater where there are many men who say they are sent by God and who invent so many stupid things, close quote. Bruno was amazed to hear this language coming out of the mouth of someone who had been telling him to believe in Jesus Christ. What are you saying? You say the same things I heard in my house as a boy, blasphemies and insults to the priest, whom we called cockroach. Otto explained, I'm a Protestant. We are against the assertions of the Catholic Church, beginning with confession, which is the invention of priest to spy, and then we are also against the Mass, the Eucharist, the Immaculate Conception, etc., Otto continued, Do you know who is paying for this war that we are fighting? It is the beast of the apocalypse, number 666. This beast, feeding on idolatry, who is responsible for the ignorance of the poor, who brings misery to the people and pays for wars and revolutions, is in Rome, in the Vatican. It's the Pope, who sits on God's throne, showing himself, saying that he is God. Bruno shuddered, I had a murderous thought. If he's responsible for so much evil, I'll kill him. I went into a shop in Toledo that sold knives and bought a small sharp dagger with a bone handle and sheath and I graved death to the Pope on the blade. And I said to myself, if I happen to meet the beast in Rome, I swear that I will save the people by killing him. In June 1939, Bruno returned to Italy and was greeted by his wife and little daughter, Isola. As soon as she saw me, she hugged me and through her tears told me, Our Lady of Pompeii brought you home safely. But what are you saying? I came back by myself. No, it's because of the prayers I saw and I have sat here in front of the picture of Our Lady of Pompeii. And Bruno responded, we must destroy all images, rosaries, and crucifix and burn all these idolatrous and diabolical superstitions. And I started to open drawers, rummaging in the furniture, looking for any religious object to destroy it and burn it. I started with the painting of Our Lady of Pompeii, which I threw on the ground, trampling it, and after crushing it, burned the image. Then I pulled a wooden crucifix off the wall, which I broke into pieces on my knees and threw it into the garbage. He found a modestly paying but steady job working for the city bus and tram company. He rented a small apartment and every Sunday went to the Evangelical Baptist Church. He tried to persuade his wife to become Protestant as well, but in spite of his screams and slaps, she resisted tenaciously. One day she told him, Look, Bruno, I'll follow you if you prove that the Catholic Church is false. Why not make the first Fridays of the next nine months going to confession and receiving communion? If after that you still want to stick with your choice, I'll follow you. If instead the Lord will have you made you change your mind, you will return to the Catholic Church. Bruno accepted her challenge with a solemn oath and made the first Fridays from February to October 1940. At the end of the challenge, he told his wife that he still felt the same and so she would have to follow him. He worked hard with some success to bring others out of the Catholic Church. On Easter Sunday, 1943, the Baptist preacher rebaptized Bruno and his wife. Some years later, Bruno met the pastor of the Seventh day Adventist Church. And because he found the Adventist pastor more intransigent towards the Catholic Church than his pastor, on September 8, 1945, Bruno left the Baptist Church and joined the Seventh day Adventist. In 1946, Bruno was appointed the director of the Adventist Missionary Youth Association. At that time, there were about 15 people in the community. In less than two years, those numbers swelled to 150, thanks to Bruno's vigorous propaganda and the groceries donated by American Adventists. In his great hatred for the Beast of Rome, he devised a plan to assassinate Pope Pius XII. He'd even picked the date, September 8, 1947, the Feast of the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. 
Our Lady's birthday. And as a weapon, he intended to use the dagger on which he engraved death to the Pope. And in the meantime, Bruno didn't miss an opportunity to unleash his hatred against the Catholic clergy. He encouraged his children to spit on every piece they met in the street. Once he caused a serious accident, closing the doors of a bus while a priest was getting off. The poor man fractured both of his legs in the fall. Bruno managed to steal the black leather bag of another priest and hide it under his seat while the priest was busy searching his wallet for money for a ticket. When the priest noticed the theft, he asked me if I had noticed something. I told him I'd seen a pastor get off with that bag in his hand, but I had thought it had belonged to him. On Easter Saturday, April 12, 1947, Bruno attended the Seventh-day Adventist services. We meet on Saturdays instead of Sundays. The pastor gave Bruno the assignment to preach publicly against Our Lady, and in particular against her Immaculate Conception and her perpetual virginity. He went home for lunch. He intended to take his family to the beach while he prepared his sermon. Yolanda couldn't go. She was bedridden because she hadn't yet recovered from yet another violent beating from her husband. Carrying his notebook and a Protestant Bible tucked in the very leather bag he'd stolen from the priest, he set off with his three children, Isola, age 10, Carlo, age 7, and Gianfranco, age 4. They just missed the train, so Bruno decided to take them to a place he'd roamed as a boy, a beautiful place covered with a thick grove of eucalyptus trees and any number of small caves, the Hill of Tre Fontane. The Hill of Tre Fontane was, of course, the very place where exactly 10 years before to the very day, on April 12, 1937, Luigi Snappi had seen the Blessed Virgin Mary and had been told that, quote, I will return to this place of sin and I will convert and make use of a man who combats the church and who will desire to kill the Pope, close quote. On the way to Tre Fontane, Bruna passed a statue of Our Lady which had the words Virgin Mother carved on the base. He stopped, pulled out his pencil, and wrote on the base of the statue, You are neither virgin nor mother. While the older kids played ball, he sat in the shade of a eucalyptus tree with little Gianfranco at his side, studying his Bible and preparing to talk to ridicule the Mac of Conception. The first sentence that Bruno wrote that morning is so bad I can't even repeat it. They lost the ball and called their father to help find it. Bruno told little Gianfranco not to move and went with Carlo to find the ball while Isola began to pick flowers to bring to her mom. They couldn't find the ball, and when Bruno returned, Gianfranco was nowhere to be seen. He called two or three times, but there was no response. There's a small, wide, low cave nearby, and Bruno quickly climbed up to it, where he saw Gianfranco kneeling at the entrance, his eyes fixed toward the back of the cave, repeating over and over again, Bella Signora, Bella Signora, beautiful lady, beautiful lady. Later on, little Gianfranco explained that the beautiful lady had taken him by the hand while he was sitting on the tree and led him to the cave. Since Adventists pray standing without joining their hands, Bruno was angry that his little boy was so obviously imitating Catholic prayer, kneeling with his hands joined. He said to Isola, I don't want you children to play beautiful lady, but she replied that she didn't know that game. Bruno continued, having said this, the little girl stopped, turned, goes to the cave and drops her bouquet, kneels to the right of Gianfranco, joins her hand in prayer, and stares at the back of the cave and starts repeating, beautiful lady. I thought they were teasing me, so I gave a slight slap to Carlo and told him to go play too. He said, Daddy, I don't know this game. He no sooner finished the sentence than he stops, turns, goes to the cave, kneels to the right of Isola, and then begins to repeat with the rest, beautiful lady. It seemed like they had swallowed a gramophone record, continually repeating the same phrase. Well, that did it. Bruno lost his temper, grabbed Carlo under the armpits, and with a curse tried to lift him. But he didn't even budge him. It was like trying to lift a solid block of granite anchored in the ground. The child was completely immovable. And it was the same when he tried to move Isola and Gianfranco. Bruno. I look in the cave, I think. Maybe it's a witch's lair. Or is it the devil? Or some priest playing a joke to scare us? I run in with clenched fists, shouting, Who's in here? Up! Get out! Come out! But the cave is dark, empty. There's no one. I was filled with fear. I go out and the kids are still in the same position. I shout at them. I saw a Carlo, Gianfranco, get up. I was paralyzed with fear and I thought, I hope I'm dreaming. And I cried out from the depths of my heart, God save us. I began running from side to side looking for help, then stopped and burst into tears with my hands in my hair. No sooner had I cried, God save us, when suddenly I saw two pure white hands moving toward me and lightly touching my face. Something was pulled from my eyes. 
I felt some pain and I found myself in the deepest darkness. I could neither see the cave nor what was inside. And I found myself kneeling with my hands joined in prayer. A true peace, a tranquility, an indescribable joy that I'd never experienced entered into me. Then I see inside the darkness of the cave, a small light becoming increasingly larger. It gets stronger as if the sun, a thousand suns blazing with intense light had entered the cave, making everything disappear. And I feel weightless and wrapped in an unknown light. In the midst of this supernatural light, I see with astonishment and emotion that I can barely endure, the figure of a woman of paradise." Close quote. So Bruno saw a beautiful woman wrapped with an intense golden light, which despite its incredible brilliance, he could look at without harm. She had a motherly but sad expression, wearing a grain veil over a brilliant white dress and a rose-colored sash around her waist. In her hand, she held an ash-gray book, the Bible. She was standing barefoot on a rock, which was also glowing from the heavenly light. He was already in a state of joyful ecstasy, but her face captured his eyes and heart. As he said later, quote, He who experiences exceptional joy of resting his eyes on such a heavenly beauty would only want death in order to enjoy such beauty forever. Close quote. An indescribably beautiful fragrance filled the cave. He saw that the beautiful lady was slowly moving her left hand and pointing to something at her feet. He looked in on the ground, he saw a crumpled black cassock, on top of which was a smashed crucifix. She began speaking to Bruno slowly and rhythmically for about an hour. And although his children could see her and her lips moving, throughout it all they heard nothing. Later, Bruno could remember every single word as if it were some recording in his mind that he could replay over and over. Now most of this message was secret, it remained so until recently when Severa Gaeta discovered a copy of it in Bruno's journals. As far as I know, these excerpts are the first translation of this message into English. I'm indebted to the good Catholic woman who so generously helped me with the translations, and I commend her to your prayers. The Virgin of Revelation, quote, I am she, who is related to the Divine Trinity. I am the Virgin of Revelation. You persecute me. Enough now. Come back to the Holy Fold, the eternal miracle of God, where Christ laid the first stone, that foundation on the eternal rock, Peter. Do not forget who has always loved you and never forgotten you. We think of his first communion retreat. You have been saved through the nine first Fridays of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, a divine promise that you made before entering into lies and making yourself an enemy of God and a merciless, unfounded enemy. Repent. Do penance for the salvation of others. I will always be close to you. Your faithful bride and hundreds of other people in your same condition will enter the fold. The means that I will use is you. Be strong and strengthen the weak. Uphold the strong and reassure the unbelievers with prayers. I will convert the most obstinate with miracles I will work with this sinful soil. Our Lady was speaking of the soil of the grotto, which was a place that up till then had a bad reputation as a place of great immorality. And true to Our Lady's promises, the dirt from the grotto of Tre Fontane has proven to be miraculous, just as Lourdes is famous for its miraculous water. More on that tomorrow. Your friends will become your enemies and will launch themselves against you to dishearten you. Be strong. You will be consoled in the exact moment that you believe you are abandoned. God prizes and values the conversion of the obstinate sinner. I tell you that my heart always cries in a spiritual mystical sense for disbelief and sin against God. Come to the heart of Jesus. Come to the heart of a mother and you will be consoled, and you will be unburdened of your sorrows. All sinners come. Consecrate yourself to the Immaculate Heart of a Mother, without doubting that you will be helped. Who can lament of being banished from me if he has consecrated himself to my heart? Who has ever sought help and has not been helped? Here is a sign for you. To every priest that you will meet, you will say, Father, I must speak to you. If he answers, Ave Maria, my son, what do you want? and then points to another priest and says, this is who you need. Do not be silent. He is the one who will bring you back into the holy fold of God, the heavenly court on earth. Where is charity? What are the fruits of love? 
Hard-hearted, they are used to being hardened, especially shepherds of the flock who do not do their duty and give a scandal to the flock and divert it from the way, the truth, and the life because too much of the world has come into their souls. Go back to the beginning, to the source of evangelical unity, charity far from the world. You are in the world, but not of the world. How many miracles, how many apparitions, all for nothing, far from life and the truth of the Father who loves. Hard times are prepared for you. And before Russia converts and leaves the way of atheism, a tremendous and severe persecution will arise. Pray it can be stopped. The time is now passing to the end of all things of the world. The word of the one who made everything is true. Prepare your hearts. Draw closer with more fervor to the living sacrament among you, the Eucharist, which one day will be desecrated and no longer believed to be the real presence of my Son. Draw near to the heart of Jesus, my Son. Consecrate yourselves to the heart of a mother which bleeds, always in a mystical sense, continually for you. Give praise to God who is among you. Distance yourself from the false things of the world, vain shows, obscene pictures, superstitions of every kind. Falsehood and other evils, vanity and spiritism, are things that the evil one will use for the persecution of God's creature. Satan is loosed for a period of time for the sanctification of the saints. Children, be strong. Resist the infernal assault. Do not be afraid. I will be with you with my motherly heart to give courage to yours and soothe your sorrows. The entire church will undergo a terrible test to clean up the carnage that is infiltrated among its ministers especially among the orders of poverty, moral testing, spiritual testing. For the time indicated in the heavenly books, the forces of evil will endanger priests and faithful by assaulting them with whatever means they can, especially false ideologies and theologies. With Christ as leader, I will fight for you. Here are the weapons of the enemy. Reflect on it. Blasphemy. Sins of the flesh obscenity, hunger, illness, death, astonishments worked by science. Here are the weapons that will make you strong and victorious. Faith, fortitude, love, uprightness, constancy in good things, the gospel, meekness, truth, purity, honesty, patience, bearing everything far from the world and its poisonous attendance. Ask to be saints and do good, and to sanctify yourselves, distance yourself from the world while living in the world. Humanity is lost because it no longer has ones who lead it sincerely in justice. There are terrible times for all. Faith and charity will remain intact if you are attentive to what I tell you. These are moments of trial for all of you. Stay fast on the eternal rock of the living God. I will show you the path from which the saints exit victoriously to the divine kingdom. The path is love, love, and love. The Holy Spirit will soon descend upon you to strengthen you, if you ask him with faith to prepare yourselves and to fortify yourselves in the day of God's great battle. Preserve the weapon of victory, faith. Love one another. Love one another so much, annulling in yourselves the depths of haughtiness and pride, humility in the hearts. Love each other and greet each other with greetings of love and unity. God bless us. At this point, Bruno asked to be able to add as a response, and the Virgin protect us, and Our Lady consented. Abolish hatred. There will be days of sorrow and mourning. From the east, a strong people, but far away from God, will unleash a tremendous attack, will break the most holy and sacred things when it will be allowed them to do so. You will have love and faith, love and faith, all to make the saints shine like the stars in heaven. Pray much, and you will be relieved of persecution and pain. 
to transform sinful flesh from sin to sanctity, do penance with pure love, with obedience to the true guardian of the heavenly court on earth, the Pope. What was, has been, and ever will be the purpose of Christ's death? To appease the wrath of paternal justice and to sprinkle his creatures with his pure and precious blood in order to fill them with love until they love one another. It is love that wins everything, divine love, love of virtue. Do not forget the rosary, which cooperates much with your sanctification. The Hail Marys, which you say with faith and love, are so many golden arrows that reach the heart of Jesus. The world will enter another war, more ruthless than the previous ones. Satan's wrath is no longer held back. Children become holy and sanctify yourselves. Love each other much and always. The darkening of conscience and evil that will increase will testify to you of the coming of the final catastrophe. Anger will be unleashed over all the earth. Satanic freedom, which will be allowed, will bring massacres everywhere. Unite yourselves in the love of God. Make one rule, the living gospel. Be strong in the truth of the Spirit. The sheepfold of Christ is and will be the salvation of all who want to be saved. You will see men driven by Satan make a united league to fight every form of religion. The most stricken will be the Church of Christ to cleanse it of the filth that is in it. At the end, many will be converted through the many prayers and through the return to love of all and through powerful divine manifestations. Permission will be given for a time to those who destroy everything and everyone. Then the Lamb will show his eternal victory. He will destroy evil with good, the flesh with the spirit, hatred with love. The holiness of the Father, that's what the Virgin calls the Pope, the holiness of the Father reigning as sovereign of divine love will suffer greatly for a while from something, briefly, which under his reign will happen. A few others will still reign on the throne. The last one, a saint, will love his enemies, showing it, creating unity and love, he will see the victory of the Lamb. Priests are dear to me. They will, tra- they will be trampled and slaughtered. Here's the broken cross near the cassock, which signify the stripping of the exterior signs of the priesthood. When these things come to pass, this will be the sign that it is the time that charity will become cold. Charity that will cool was a concept Bruno repeated in public meditations. At this time, the priests will show that they are truly my children by living in purity far from the world, by being more righteous, by following the way of Calvary. The laity united one faith, giving a good example of righteousness in the world, must work very hard among the ranks of Satan to prepare the the hearts for salvation. Never tired of being, being close to the heart of the Eucharistic Jesus. Line up under the standard of Christ. Fortify yourselves, preparing for the battle of faith. Do not be lazy in the things of God. You'll see times that men will do the will of the flesh better than that of God, being constantly dragged in the mud and into the abyss of voluntary perdition. God's righteousness will soon be heard on earth. Do penance. Only the saints who are among you, in the hermitages and in convents, and in every place, hold back the destructive anger of divine justice. The moment is terrible. For that day comes which will soon descend upon the earth. There is still time for sinners to repent and place their entire lives under my mantle in order to be saved. Go to the loving heart of Jesus, my son. Fill yourselves with love. Wash yourselves with the blood of divine redemption. You will bring these things to the holiness of the Father, the Holy Father, at the time that will be revealed to you by a priest who will be your guide. I will send him to you in due time. If someone asks you, talk about what you were and what you are now after this grace. But for now, be silent. I will guide you. Do not be afraid of the assaults of your friends that you will see as enemies. Come to the grotto to pray for all unbelievers, heretics, and obstinate sinners. Pray much for those whom you have deceived. Bring them along the path of the way, the truth, and the life. Say this to them. The way is one, Christ the Catholic sheepfold, apostolic, Roman, and the holiness of the Father, the Pope, is the true representative of the heavenly court on earth. The truth is one. God the Father, 
His holiness, and His justice. The life is one, the Holy Spirit, in His sacraments and in His ministers. I am the beloved of the Divine Trinity, the love of the Father because I am the daughter, the beloved of the Son because I am the mother, and the beloved of the Holy Spirit because I am bride. Love, love, love. When she finished speaking, she smiled at Bruno and the children, turned around, walked through the wall of the grotto, and disappeared. Bruno was in a daze, but before they left the cave, he used his door key to scratch a message. Quote, On 12th April 1947, the Virgin of Revelation appeared in this grotto to the Protestant Bruno Cornicola and his children, and he was converted. Close quote. The children were all excited as they went to, to a nearby church to make a thanksgiving. He pointed to the tabernacle and told his children, Remember that I told you that Jesus was not present in the Eucharist in that little piece of white bread? Well, I stand corrected. I have to tell you that Jesus is there, that he is really present. Bruno told his children to say nothing, but as soon as they got back to the apartment block, the kids told everyone they met. When they came home, his wife could smell a beautiful perfume coming from them. Bruno threw himself at her, at her feet and burst into tears. What I taught you, uh, taught you about the Madonna is all false. It's true what the children said. We saw an apparition in a cra cave at Tre Fontane. Forgive me, Yolanda, of all the evil I have done to you. Yolanda was stunned by such a profound change in her husband. She knelt down and embraced him, and they remained in prayer for a long time. Our Lady had given Bruno a message and a mission. You will bring these things to the holiness of the Father, the Holy Father, at the time that will be revealed to you by a priest who will be your guide. I will send him to you in due time. But first Our Lady told him he had to locate the priest she had chosen to bring Bruno back into the church. She had told Bruno, to every priest you will meet, you will say, Father, I must speak to you. If he answers, Ave Maria, my son, what do you want? And then points to another priest and says, this is who you need. Do not be silent. He is the one who will bring you back into the holy fold of God the heavenly court on earth. The very next morning, in obedience to Our Lady, Bruno began searching for this priest. This is actually a real test that Our Lady put him through. In the 1940s, there were a lot of priests in Rome. Bruno is continually bumping into priests and making this request over and over and over again. Father, I must talk to you. And then time and again, the priest didn't give the right answer, which left Bruno standing there looking like a moron. And then just after asking if he could talk to the priest, he had to immediately excuse himself as if he had nothing to say, and leave the poor priest with the impression that Bruno was either rude or out of his mind. He took a lot of abuse over this. Finally, after more than two weeks of this, he was nearing the end of his rope and falling into despair when everything happened just as Our Lady predicted. The priest who was finally directed to put Bruno and Yolanda through catechetical instructions, then had them place their hands on the Holy Bible and abjure the errors of Protestantism and heard their confessions. That evening, Bruno returned to the cave. As he was praying, suddenly the Virgin appeared. Quote, Radiant and smiling, she looks at me and makes a sign with her head as if to say yes, and she's gone. The cave is completely filled with a beautiful fragrance. Everything is joy in my heart. The case made the newspapers. Bruno and the children were even interrogated separately by the police, but they were unable to find any significant differences in any of their accounts. Finally, in mid-June 1947, Bruno and his three children were called before a commission of the Vicariate of Rome. After Bruno had given his testimony, the president of the commission asked him if he ever wondered if it was the devil who appeared to him. And Bruno replied, Well, if what appeared to me to tell me to return to the Catholic Church is the devil, then he is converted, and there is no more near to the church. Hell is closed. The fighting between Christ and Satan is over. So you don't need to have any. You don't have anything to do anymore. Close everything and go away. If, however, the devil did not convert and he sent me to you, that means that you agree with him. Then I was fine as I was. Little Gianfranco's testimony is particularly endearing. The judges had to chase him around the room, bribe me with candy in order to interview him. What did you see? I saw a lady. And what was this lady like? Beautiful. Oh, like us? No. She was beautiful, more beautiful. Like that statue over there? She wasn't a statue, she was alive. The testimony of this little four-year-old actually impressed the judges. One wrote, quote, 
This explanation means it's an authentic apparition. Close quote. Another wrote, quote, My judgment was of credibility, especially because of the naive testimony of that child. Close quote. A few weeks later, on July 22, 1947, a Vatican car picked up Bruno at home at 2 a.m. Accompanied by a priest, he ascended to the apartment of Pius XII, where three Jesuits were present. In regard to Pius XII, uh, Pius XII had told one of the Jesuits that he knew about the apparition and he wished to meet the seer. Bruno recorded the scene in his diary. Quote, I was excited and I read the message, leaving it to the Pope, who wept to hear it. We took an oath not to speak. It's a secret, but posterity should know. Close quote. Now, many years later, Bruno's spiritual director revealed another interesting detail. Pius XII himself had revealed to Bruno that on that April 12th, the Pope himself had received confirmation directly from Our Lady of her appearance elsewhere in Rome. At a later date, Bruno met the Pope in a public gathering. On that occasion, he fell to his knees before the Holy Father and with tears in his eyes, gave him the dagger engraved with debt to the Pope, with which he had planned to kill him, and begged for forgiveness which Pius XII instantly granted him, telling that if he had carried out his plan, he would have given one more martyr and one more pope to the church. At that audience, the pope encouraged Bruno to give public conferences and told him, quote, be constant in truth, close quote. Permission for pilgrimages and devotion to the Virgin of Revelation was given with unusual speed by the Vicariate of Rome. Pope Pius XII blessed a statue of Our Lady, the Virgin of Revelation, in St. Peter's Square on October 5, 1947 less than six months after her appearance to Bruno and his children. After the Pope blessed the statue, it was taken amidst huge crowds in a seven and a half mile long procession from St. Peter's Square to Tre Fontane. According to the estimates of the public authorities, there were 100,000 people in the procession when it arrived at the cave. In October 1982, the Diocese of Rome erected an altar in front of the cave. It's worth hearing a brief explanation of how that came about. Over the years, Bruno had specific premonitions about many events. For example, in February 1982, he sent a warning to the Pope with an apology for skipping the proper protocols about an upcoming attempt on his life. On April 22, 1982, Bruno received a reply from the Vicariate of Rome telling him that, quote, his letter addressed to the Holy Father on Easter holidays has arrived in his august hands, close quote. In May, the Pope went to Fatima to thank Our Lady for saving him. And in fact, while he was in Fatima, a priest of the Society of St. Pius X, Father Juan Fernandez Crone, stabbed the Pope with a bayonet and wounded him, but was stopped before he could kill him. St. John Paul II, who as a cardinal had visited and prayed at the grotto, ordered that an altar be erected in front of the cave, and then sent personal delegates to speak with Bruno about the warning he had sent, and to let him know that that was the reason why he had ordered the altar to be erected in the grotto. At the shrine, the Vicariate of Rome has a public chapel staffed by conventional Franciscans where the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is publicly offered. Through the many miracles, the number of people who pray at the grotto and make pilgrimages there is steadily increasing. In Lourdes, Our Lady works miracles with the water and Rome with the soil. The dirt from what was once a place of sin and immorality has become a source of grace. More on that tomorrow. As for Bruno, in April 1948, under the direction of Our Lady, He founded a catechetical association and devoted his life to teaching the truth to non-Catholics, fallen away Catholics, and Catholic youth. Here was a man who truly understood the absolute importance of living in and according to the true faith. As he would ask, all religions, they say, give salvation. But then I say, why did Jesus come if there were already so many religions? And he often asked, if even the Protestants are saved, why did the Virgin come to me and tell me to go back to the Holy Sheepfold? when she could have left me very well where I was, among Adventists. One day, a nun asked Bruno to go visit a crippled priest. Quote, I asked him how he'd hurt himself, and he replied it had happened by falling from a bus in Piazza Giocino Belli. I looked at him, and I cried, Father, it was me. It was me. I did it on purpose because I hated priests. I beg you to forgive me of my crime. He blessed me, we embraced, we both wept. 
That first message at Tre Fontane on April 12, 1947, was only the first of 60 messages, dreams, and prophecies that he received periodically up to a few months before his death. He died on June 22, 2001. And through it all, he always pointed out, repeated to his various directors and confessors, and even wrote on the bottom of some messages that, quote, the above facts are to be believed by pure human faith, and I subject myself to every judgment of Mother Church, close quote. We'll take a closer look at some of those messages and miracles tomorrow. As for Luigina Sinapi, Bruno didn't know anything about her experience at Tre Fontane until after her death. She had holy death in Rome in 1978. In 1987, she appeared to him and said, April 12, 1937. You have to offer yourself as a victim for the conversion and sanctification of priests and religious who abandon the path of doctrine and morality, by whose fault many souls go to hell. We'll close with an officially approved prayer to the Virgin of Revelation. Most Holy Virgin of Revelation, you who are in the Divine Trinity, we beg you to turn your merciful and benevolent gaze toward us. O Mary, who are our powerful advocate before God, and can obtain miracles for the conversion of unbelievers and sinners. Help us obtain from your Son Jesus the salvation of our souls, perfect health of the body, and all the graces we need. Give the church and its leader, the Roman pontiff, the joy of seeing the conversion of its enemies, the spread of the kingdom of God throughout the world, the unity of believers in Christ, and peace to all nations. We beg for the true peace of all nations so we can better love and serve you in this life and merit to come one day to see and thank you eternally in heaven. Amen.